headed to the Grand Canyon Skywalk. Three hours probably left of the drive from Zion. Here we go. We're on a reservation. The west rim of the Grand Canyon. It is Odwalpa Tribal Nation. I'm working for my first time ever working for an Indian nation. That's really I'm cool. This is the Grand Canyon we're looking at. Joshua trees I've looked up now are protected because of climate change. So due to the droughts, the Joshua trees are used to having by like 40% are being protected because younger Joshua trees haven't been thriving in a very, very long time. Joshua trees, they inhabit a lot of owls, hawks, many birds. Especially there are some things that live in cactuses. They go into the Joshua tree, so they are important. About 20 miles away from the bridge. My dad was trying to pee in the forest though. Oh, here's a big one. It's a big one. See the sky rim, sky bridge, sky sump. Juana first. Juanita. We got a Juanita. Haley, Harold, Harriet. Heather, Helen, Holly, Howard. Again, no Hillary, never. Never is there ever a Hillary. Who's named Harriet these days though, for real? I don't know, they never have my name on these things. West Rim, you can have access to Eagle Point, Guano Point, and the Skywalk. It is very touristy. We did not go through Grand Canyon National Park, so this is not owned federally. It doesn't get any funding. All its funding is from strictly tourism, visiting. We're getting on the shuttle for the three B points. Uh, so what we did is we just took a little bus, drop you off at different points. We made it. We're at the Skywalk Cafe. This is Eagle Point. I don't see the eagle though. Oh, I see it. Oh, his head's kind of like shrunk. Yeah. 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 Holy cow, those birds creep me out. Up there? Oh wow, yeah. To the top of Guano Point. lockers to put every all your stuff in for the skywalk and they don't let you bring any phones or anything so they make you buy their pictures but at least it's going towards the people of the grand canyon they have a gift shop and everything there were a ton of people it was very very busy but it's the grand canyon so you know.
Welcome to an anthro moment. Indigenous populations were rudely forced out of the Grand Canyon uh, by the National Park Service and the government in like the late 1800s, early 1900s. I think it was like 1902 or something crazy like that. Yeah, they were basically like slowly forced out. Like, oh, you can have this annual permit to use your land for free. And then it was like, but they never knew if they were gonna take it away or what was gonna happen. And the Havasu Nation, and basically the, there's 11 different but they only really talk about three of them, to be honest. They were usually migrating around, so they would be there in the summertime at the Grand Canyon, and in the wintertime they would leave. So they used the Grand Canyon for farming, and I think their biggest thing they grew was like corn. What's frustrating is then they were forced, after they took this permit out, I guess, then they told them, hey, you're just gonna have to live here, and this is the spot you're going to get, and you're gonna have to deal with it and good luck out there is basically what they did and they were like ah we you know they're they're used to migrating they're used to leaving and they don't usually survive there in the winter the place that they were forced up into on the plateau was bad farming ground so they couldn't even do the kind of farming they usually do so they're basically like sol right they're like pushed all the way up and they're like hey I can't even live here. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? Made life there. And then eventually they were literally just government officials. I don't know, part of the National Park Service will come in and be like, hey, get out. You're done here and force them to leave. So no, it wasn't by choice to leave it all, which is really sad. And on the National Park, the Grand Canyon National Park website, it talks about it a little bit, but it was like, hey, but you know, they still live here and they're great and doing great, but you know, that's kind of messed up. That's very messed up. I'm trying to find more information, but they keep grouping them all together and they're not the same people at all. Yes, they lived amongst each other. They traded and they also had a huge war. I was reading the story about how I believe like a Hopi kid was stolen and they were raised as a Navajo. And at the time of the war, this guy uh, that was kind of like in the middle ground was like, hey man, you're not Navajo, you're a Hopi. You need to go meet your people. And he was like, oh shoot, I'm gonna go meet my people. And <laughs> then he was like, well, good luck. Cause you're wearing Navajo clothes. You're gonna get killed. Good luck out there. So he was like, okay, my plan is I'm just gonna put my head down, you know, cry a lot and be like, look, man, I didn't choose this life for me. I was stolen and I'll find my parents. And I guess that's exactly how it went down and it worked out for him. <laughs> he met his people. Um, but it also seems like they tr would trade and the Hopi would just be like, hey, I'm gonna stay here for a year. We're gonna trade it up and then you're gonna come back and <laughs> I'll go back to my land. And I forgot when the war was. I, 1883 keeps popping in my head, but I don't know if that's because of Yellowstone or what. Yeah, there's a lot going on this time. We got white people coming in. We got uh, tribes fighting amongst themselves. We got, you know, the government being like, hey, you know what, this is really pretty land. We're gonna, you know, save the squirrels and we're gonna kick you out of it. All happening around the same time. Uh, so there's just enemies everywhere. If you're at Guana Point, you can see an example, a Hogan wet house, sweat room, sweat lodge, sweat lodge, that's what it's called. Small stones are heated on the fire and placed in the middle of the mud hut. Here we go, into the sweat lodge. I know I was watching this video from the Havasu Reservation. It said that they used the sweat lodges to promote praying for the water. So they thank the water, they would pray for the water like every day, like where the waterfalls are, like those big ponds that it would create. And then they would say thank you and pray for the water also in the sweat lodges. The water was the most thing they prayed for, which they live in a desert, which makes a ton of sense that they're gonna sit there and you know thank the water and be appreciative that they have water and this beautiful water. It's just a completely different environment to grow up in. Make out point. In the sweat lodge? Yeah. There's a prey in there. Man. Who drew on this? It's terrible. There's a window. I wonder where they put the rocks. In the back? We didn't even need rocks to sweat in this thing. It is cooler than the mud one for sure. Okay, so the Hogan's are usually round shape. They usually have like a little circular top of top to get the smoke out. They're made from wooden poles, tree bark, and mud, and they always face east for the rising sun. And we got to go in one, which is really cool. It says some people still live in them. 
I don't know how accurate that is. The houses of the Hopi are used for shelter, work, storage, and ceremonial practices. The distinguishing characteristic of the Hopi building is the stonework. Bathroom areas? Well, yeah, you have a bad fire. This thing is lit up. Yeah, that looks like an oven to me. It's got a smokestack. Grand Canyon, I forgot what it was called. <laughs> There, they had like two different ones, but they are made out of the same materials. So they're trying to say those are both from the Navajo. Uh, some of them had stone in them, which I know the Hopi were very big on stone, and they did trade, so it's possible that that's where they were getting their stone from. To support the indigenous populations around the Grand Canyon, you can visit the West Rim. You can also visit the Havasupai Reservation, which has these beautiful waterfalls and I really wish I went to now. There's a lodge, so the lodge is a little under 2,000 and uh, three nights, four days at their lodge at the reservation, which actually isn't terrible. Uh, each room has like two beds and full bathrooms. Campgrounds are pretty bare bones, just like you'd get at the national parks. They have bathrooms, water access. But what is really cool about this area are these pools of water from the waterfalls are beautiful. Most, I don't know if they're all related to their language, um, translating to blue green water, but uh, their names are created from the indigenous word of some form that means blue green and then people. So they're the blue green water people. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I wish I could go there. I can go there and I probably will go there. <laughs> Havasu Falls. They have the Mooney Falls. They have Beaver Falls. They have the 50 Foot Falls and they have the Little Navajo Falls. So the Havasu Falls and Campground are two miles. Uh, it's a 45 minute hike it says. The Mooney Falls are three miles. The Beaver Falls are six and the Colorado River, it says 11 miles. So if you're a hiker and you love waterfall hikes and you also want to support some indigenous people, I'd say this is the route to go. This looks stunning and I'm a little upset that we didn't have more time. I mean, I have more time. I can always go back, right? I think I'm gonna add that to my list now. That's really cool. I wanna know how they lived in the Grand Canyon. Have you seen the Grand Canyon? It's crazy, okay? I don't, I don't even know how they got up there. There's like, they're like living in it. I don't. How'd you get up there? I wanna know. Uh, no, this is helpful. I'm just rambling on. We're just gonna, you know what? We're just gonna close it off. Right, right. Kinda like, find your own adventure. Read what you want. So I didn't really know what I was looking at when I was there. <laughs>